I am uh, Professor Dr. P.C. Manoria, Director, Manoria Heart and Critical Care Hospital, Bhopal, and past president of Cardiological Society of India. I am very thankful to Professor Salah and his team for inviting me for this wonderful conference, which is always packed with current scientific knowledge. I am also thankful to the moderators who are organizing this conference. So for the next uh, 15 minutes, I will be talking on this new topic, cardiometabolic therapeutics and liver new frontiers. Cardiometabolic diseases are rocking the entire world and are important contributors for cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. The commonest cause of mortality in cardiometabolic diseases is ACVD, particularly acute myocardial infarction. And it is the desire of all patients to have their heart beat without blockages. Lipid management, which plays a very important role in reduction of cardiovascular events. But curiously enough, most of the lipid modulating drugs which decrease cardiovascular events like acute myocardial infarction or stroke, their site of action is not in the heart or an artery. Their site of action is in the liver. And liver is emerging as a big playground for cardiometabolic therapeutics. Statins, which are the foundational drugs for lipid management, they act in the liver by inhibiting the HMG-CoA reductase Bempedoic acid, which is a new blockbuster for additional lowering of LDL cholesterol in patients with ACVD or ATFH, also acts in the liver by inhibiting the enzyme ACL in the cholesterol synthesis pathway. PCSK9 monoclonal antibodies, which squeeze LDL to very low levels, also act in the liver by binding to PCSK9. And inclisran, which melts cholesterol from the vessel wall, but at a very high price, also acts in the liver by inhibiting the synthesis of PCSK9. Pelacarsin, which is emerging as a foundational transformational therapy for LPA-induced deadly cardiovascular disease, also acts in the liver. It is an anti-sense to FOA, decreases the synthesis of FOA in the liver, and obviously LPA. Lomipodide, which is used for HOFH, also acts in the liver. It inhibits the enzyme MTTP. And mipomarsin, which is an anti-sense to FOB, also acts in the liver and is used for HOFH. ANGPLT3, that is evanacumab, which is a bone for patients of homozygous hypercholesterolemia because of its action is independent of the density of LDL liver receptors also acts in the liver. And volanisorsan, which is an antisense to FOC3, also acts in the liver, is used for familial chylomicronemia. And gene editing, which is emerging as a big advance in lipid management, the first successful agent has already, patient has already been done in New Zealand and the trial has been kicked off. Its site of execution is again in the liver and liver transplantation in past has also been done for uh, familial hypercholesterolemia. So liver is emerging as a big playground for cardiometabolic therapeutics and therefore normal functioning of liver is mandatory for optimum utilization of lipid modulating drugs to minimize ACVD and these drugs we use in our day-to-day -day practice. The bug in the big in result issue is what will happen to the action of lipid modulating drugs if the liver is diseased? This is an unresolved issue at the present state of time and reads further research. Now, liver is not only a big playground for lipid therapeutics, but is also a great initiator and perpetuator for development of ACVD. All of us know there is a very close cross connect between liver and diabetes. NFLD predisposes to development of diabetes and diabetes adversely affects NFLD. And there's also a close relationship between NFLD and ACVD. In fact, 
NFLD is a red flag for development of ACVD irrespective of the other risk factors. If we look at the natural history of diabetes, you can see insulin resistance predates the development of diabetes. Macrovascular disease predates the development of diabetes. And because insulin resistance predates the development of diabetes, this leads to development of NFLD even in the pre-diabetic state, as you can see in this slide. And many renowned hepatologists believe that diabetes is a disease of the liver. First, NFLD develops in diabetes, and there are serious studies to show that NFLD is followed by development of diabetes. If there is a fat in the liver, this is bad because through several pathways it leads to hypertension, ACVD, and this is executed by insulin resistance so that if you have insulin resistance, it leads to hyperglycemia, glucotoxicity, endothelial dysfunction, uh, increased lipids, prothrombotic states, systemic inflammation, hypertension, and so on, and ultimately, atherosclerosis develops. So if NFLD develops even in a pre-diabetic state, will it result in development of CAD in pre-diabetics? The answer is yes. And a lot of data is emerging for coronary artery disease even in the pre-diabetes stage for which we have paid little attention. And these are some of the publications. I'll briefly discuss them. Now, this is a single center retrospective study from 25,000 patients from Michigan, USA. And you can see uh, 25,000 patients, cardiovascular events was 18% in 12,000 pre-diabetics as against 11% in the control group. They were more in males obese and those with family history of diabetes. So pre-diabetes may not be as benign as once thought. This is another publication. You can see pre-diabetic patients can have single vessel disease, double vessel disease, triple vessel disease, even left main stem disease. And this is another publication recently which has shown pre-diabetes predicts adverse cardiovascular outcomes after percutaneous uh, coronary intervention. This is a meta-analysis. And this is another publication which shows Pre-diabetes is associated with high atherosclerotic burden and coronary artery disease complexity that is similar to a diabetic than a normal glycemic individual. Now, this is a very interesting study from Germany. And this shows the impact of NFLD on the incidence of cardiovascular disease in a primary care. You can see the study included 22,000 patients of NFLD with a match cohort of 22,000 patients without NFLD and followed for 10 years, diabetics are only 6%. You can see a statistically significant increase in CHD by 35%. This is the p-value. A statistically significant increase in myocardial infarction, 35% and a statistically significant increase in atrial fibrillation by 15%, and the strokes were only increased numerically by 9%. And as you can see, uh, diabetics were only 6.2%, clearly giving the message that fatty liver can occur in non-diabetic patients also. Now, this is a Korean study which shows that as the level of uh, ALT increases, you can see there is an increase in the mortality. And this shows that uh, if you have NFLD, uh, more chances or more risk of development of acute myocardial infarction and stroke. And if you have a fatty liver, one of the excellent ways of treating it is to have a very low caloric diet, 600 calories per day. And you can see 36% uh, liver fat Within a period of four weeks, the fat has been reduced to 2%, which is very, very interesting. So the big question which arises is when an AMI is admitted in our day-to-day -day practice, should the cardiologist also ask for evaluation of NFLD? Now, this is not the usual practice, but very interesting uh, 
statement has appeared from the European Association of Study of Liver in 2019, and they have recommended a screening for NFLD in high-risk CBD patients also. It is, of course, recommended for obese and uh, uh, metabolic syndrome. Now, liver also plays a very important part in the development of uh, diabetes. All of us know NFLD, which occurs even in the pre-diabetic state, produces an insulin resistance in the liver. This increases hepatic output of glucose uh, into the blood, and diabetes develops. Decreasing fat in the liver will postpone development of diabetes, and obviously, it will also have an impact on cardiovascular disease because all of us know diabetes is also a driver of cardiovascular disease. Interestingly, some of the anti-diabetic medications, at least in part, they also mediate their action via the liver. Metformin, bioglutazone, SGLT2 inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor agonist, you can see here, uh, metformin decreases hepatic glucose production, and this is one of the important mechanisms of metformin as an anti-diabetic agent. SGLT2 inhibitors, they also reduce liver fat, lower ALT and ACD, F54 levels, and also elevate NFLD. Pioglitazone also has an action on the liver, it decreases lipid accumulation, increases insulin sensitivity, decreases glucose release, decreases cytokine production, and there are other actions also. And GLP-1 receptor agonist, besides several other actions, they also decrease glucose production from the liver. So the take-home message is liver is emerging as a big playground for cardiometabolic therapeutics, as I have shown you. And curiously enough, most of the lipid modulating drugs which we use in our day-to-day -day practice, they act in the liver and not in the heart or the arteries. NFLD and NASH are emerging as new risk factors for ACVD, which somehow has escaped the attention of the cardiologist. NFLD is a red flag for development of ACVD and decreasing fat in the liver is likely to have a favorable impact on ASCVD. Liver also plays an important role in the development of diabetes and decreasing fat in the liver is likely to postpone the development of diabetes. The big question, as we said, should the liver be routinely screened for NFLD in AMI? It seems logical, but this is not the usual practice. Interestingly, the European Association of Study of Liver in 2019 has recommended screening for NFLD even in high-risk patients besides being for the obese patients for uh, metabolic syndrome and other. Thank you very much. And lastly, it is for sure that cardiohepatology like cardiodiapology will emerge as a new subspecialty in times to come. Thank you very much. Thank you. To ask Dr. Manoria one question. What about uh, your suggestion for the best screening method for uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? And if there is any simple way uh, to differentiate between NASH and uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, uh, practical, practical way to differentiate between them other than uh, liver biopsy? Now we have uh, the. Uh, Elastography, which can easily differentiate whether you are in the stage of NFLD or you have progressed to NASH or you have progressed to cirrhosis. If you want to have the numbers, we have the CAP score with the fibro scan, which categorizes the fat content of liver into S1, S2, S3. We have the fibrosis grade, which also categorizes F1, F2, F3, F4. So if you want to be very precise, you can get a fibro scan, which will tell you both the fat content of the liver as well as the fibrous content of the liver. And if you are not equipped with a fibro scan, you can get sonography. And sonography can also give you a 
idea about the fat in the liver but the problem with sonography is it is less sensitive for example if you want uh, to have uh, increased liver ecogenicity without haziness of the vessel which means portal vein this is grade one grade two is increased liver ecogenicity with haziness of the vessel wall and grade three you cannot differentiate between the diaphragm and the liver and there are other methods also so at the present state of time we can easily see uh, what is the fat content of the liver? What is the grade of the fat content? What is the grade of the fibrosis? And this is very important from the prognosis point of view. If you have advanced fibrosis, your prognosis is not good. You are likely to progress to cirrhosis and some of these patients can progress to uh, malignancy. So one of the reasons to scan uh, liver in patients of AMI is from the prognostic point of view also. Suppose you have an AMI also a uh, fatty liver rather uh, Fibrosis in the liver, this is a bad prognostic sign. Same, same. Uh, what about using GLB1?